Hi, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, I'm guessing many of you are probably science lovers. Uh, I am too, I studied science, I write about science for a living. When you hear about a science center or a new lab opening in your city, uh, your knee-jerk reaction might be, oh, that's a great thing, this is something that we should celebrate. Um, this might be where the next cure for cancer is discovered. But we're here today to argue that uh, you might not want to celebrate it, that you might want to think about it and maybe even protest it. So our story begins in 1947 in Morningside Heights, New York. 14 academic and religious institutions band together under the name Morningside Heights, Inc. Their president is David Rockefeller, billionaire banker, um, and World War II has just ended, but they have declared a new war. A war against bad houses and run-down neighborhoods. So the top dog in Morningside Heights, Inc. is Columbia University. Uh, so during World War II, Columbia had formed a strong partnership with the US government, uh, important chunks of the Manhattan Project, uh, the, where the creation of the atomic bomb happened at Columbia. And uh, Columbia wanted to continue receiving a big slice of grant money pie. Um, so it sought to expand its Morningside Heights campus with a focus on escalating its science and research capacity. And an urban renewal campaign led by a coalition of local institutions was pretty attractive packaging for these efforts. Um, so by the late 1950s, top Columbia administrators were also at the helm of Morningside Heights, Inc. And to help their cause, they presented their campaign as one against a sickness. It was so-called urban blight. Uh, and they nurtured a sense that there were people living in these rundown neighborhoods who were actual carriers of blight. And they were described as a dirty group or aliens, um, and these aliens were predominantly black and brown. So uh, in the decades before, um, you had waves of Puerto Ricans, black folks from the South, um, some Haitians and Dominicans. They were newly arriving to New York City, and many of them settled in Morningside Heights. And um, across Morningside Heights in Harlem, a lot of developers were uh, converting apartments to something called single room occupancy hotels. This was basically to get around post-war rent control laws. Um, and these single room occupancy hotels, even though they were called single rooms, actually housed um, many families, many of these black and Latinx families. And because the houses were so crowded and often had little air conditioning, the residents of SROs liked to spend a lot of their time outside. So uh, kids loved to play stickball in the streets. Um, you also had folks uh, sort of hanging out, lounging on their stoops, playing cards in the streets. You also had new businesses crop up. So the first Dominican-owned bodega opened in 1933. Um, on nearby West 100th Street. Um, you know, people really, they built rich networks, they developed a sense of place. Uh, to Columbia, however, these were threats. Uh, they saw this as the whites fleeing and Harlem encroaching um, when uh, the chair of the psychology department left Columbia in the 1950s to go to UVA. A colleague said it was because, quote, the blacks got too much for him. Um, a university dean said, the future leaders of tomorrow shouldn't have to feel like, quote, paratroopers in enemy country. Um, so Columbia, with the weight of Morningside Heights, Inc. behind it, uh, you know, decided to start a campaign against these SROs. Um, they characterized these SROs as a breeding grounds for illicit activity, and they basically gobbled up as many SROs as they could and kicked out the people living in them. And they did that by allowing the buildings to deteriorate, or um, you know, a student newspaper reported that Columbia had actually like destroyed a heater of a building that people were living in. Uh, tenants would come home and find their keyholes plugged up, or their rooms had been searched without consent, trying to find you know, evidence of illegal activity. Um, you know, when that didn't work, building managers would raise rents exponentially, and if that didn't work, they would refuse rent. Uh, so imagine you are 
living in a building owned by Columbia. You've lived there for decades. Um, you've weathered deteriorating conditions. You've seen your neighbors forced out, but you, you live there with your children and you wanna stay. And so one week uh, you go to pay your rent to your building manager and he refuses it. So you mail in a money order to make sure that your rent gets in and that money order comes back to you along with a 72 hour notice to vacate your home. Um, so this happened to a George Stevenson and similar situations happened to countless others. Uh, between 1960 mm -hmm. and 1968, an estimated 9,500 tenants were forced to relocate in Morningside Heights. Um, and unsurprisingly, you know, people were pretty fed up about this. I, I would be pretty mad. Uh, so folks organized around tenants' rights. Um, this was a you know, collaborative effort between Morningside Heights residents and Harlem residents. Uh, they would graffiti Columbia-owned buildings. They would do everyday acts of resistance like sneaking back into units where they were forced to vacate. Um, unfortunately, however, Morningside Heights ultimately developed mostly to Columbia's liking. Uh, today, it is home to mostly highly educated white residents. Uh, it's distinct from Harlem. It's essentially an academic acropolis with Columbia at its heart. Um, so this wasn't just happening in Columbia in New York. This was happening across the country in Detroit, Chicago, Indianapolis. Um, it also happened in Providence, Rhode Island with Brown University, um, Claire Andrade Watkins. She grew up in a Cape Verdean neighborhood there called Fox Point, uh, and her childhood home was displaced by Brown University. She says that urban blight and urban renewal were uh, ways that university justified their aggressive growth. Uh, you needed to rationalize the same way you needed to rationalize manifest destiny, is what she says. And it wasn't just universities, and it wasn't just the post-war era either. So. Uh, this is still very much alive today. Uh, as our economies become more structured around knowledge and innovation, there's actually increased potential for people to become marginalized, especially poor communities of color to become marginalized at the hands of science, research, and tech. Uh, one example is here. This is a giant alien searching telescope <laughs> that was built by the Chinese government. Um, they started construction in 2011, it's now complete, and in the process, they evicted more than 9,000 villagers from one of the poorest provinces in China. Uh, the claim there is, you know, well, this is for discovery of all of humanity. You know, we're searching for intelligent life in the cosmos, this is a greater purpose. Uh, a similar refrain of exploration is being used to argue for the construction of a 30-meter telescope uh, on, Mon on Mauna Kea, which is sacred land in for native Hawaiians. And then you also have uh, universities like Harvard and MIT attracting a tech startup and pharmaceutical company scene in Boston. And what happens there is that these uh, tech companies and these pharmaceutical companies attract hordes of yuppie outsiders to Boston and spur development that caters to a creative class. So here you have in red, um, this is like, these are service class neighborhoods that are next to creative class neighborhoods and you see on this map that that corresponds with the red, uh, which means rent burden. So rent burden means that you pay 30% or more of your income on rent and actually the darkest red is paying 60 to 95% of your income on rent. So you really see this correlation uh, that service class neighborhoods adjacent to creative class neighborhoods are really being heavily rent burdened and these red areas are also less connected to the T, the Boston public transit system. They have generally uh, where schools and fewer amenities. Yes, question. Uh, I actually don't know exactly what the definition is for this graphic. I can find it for you if you want to, but I'm sure that it's probably related to income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could exchange contact info later and I can find it for you. Uh, so yes, yeah, so these tech startup, uh, at these tech scene takeovers, the giant telescopes and you know urban renewal campaigns are all examples of how science can be a contributing force in gentrification. 
Um, so at Free Radicals, we have sort of coined the term science washing to describe this phenomenon. So I think we all have talked about in these conversations of gentrification, what happens when a Whole Foods or a little quirky coffee shop or an art gallery moves in down the street. Um, and you know, there's conversations about art washing or how we use sort of like art as an ideal to justify you know, development and gentrification. And so in a similar manner, science washing is the practice of using science to s gloss over or soften the negative impacts of gentrification. Um, and you know, to go back to Columbia, <laughs> we're going to use the, a case study of their expansion into Manhattanville to sort of dive into how science washing works and uh, why it might not be as great as it seems. Um, and so very similar to as Steph described earlier with Columbia's expansion in Morningside Heights, uh, Columbia again wanted to expand its research facilities um, and they set their eyes on the neighborhood of Manhattanville, which is an area of West Harlem. And they, in their plan, wanted to take over the 17 acres of land, completely bulldoze over it and build their new campus. Um, and unsurprisingly, the communities in Manhattanville didn't exactly want this to happen. They had their own master plan for the community in which they welcomed Columbia's expansion, but they didn't necessarily want their whole neighborhood to be completely demolished. Um, and like in Morningside Heights, Columbia went in and started in the 90s to buy up a lot of the area, the buildings in Manhattanville, left them vacant, let them deteriorate, refused to do repairs, pressured tenants into signing bad leases, and generally was uh, very heavy handed and a kind of a bad landlord. Um, and there were still a couple of holdouts in Manhattanville, small businesses and other residents who didn't want to sell their buildings. Um, and you know, instead of building around these areas, Columbia was very intent that they needed to have this entire 17 acres of land. So they went to the city and asked uh, to use eminent domain to grab this remaining land. Um, and there are two conditions for getting to use eminent domain. One of them is that the, con the neighborhood has to be blighted. So Columbia said, hey, look at Manhattanville. It's just got all these empty warehouses. Um, so, you know, it's blighted and we should do something with this area. Even though, of course, they were the ones responsible for leaving those uh, buildings vacant and uh, blighted. And the second argument that, or the second condition for using eminent domain is that it has to be for public use. And this is the part that I think is the most interesting about um, how science washing works is that Columbia is a private university. So, um, you know, none of these buildings or facilities are really going to be open or accessible to the public. But Columbia argued basically three main things, uh, which I sort of call the three myths of science washing. So one, they said, uh, you know, we're going to be producing all this science, which is going to have such a positive public impact. Um, our researchers are hot on the trail for a cure to Alzheimer's disease and that's gonna bring so much good to the world. Um, they also were like, you know, we're a university. We're like the good guys here. You know, you're making us out to be some bad, scary real estate developer and we just wanna like do some research and teach some students. And of course they said it's gonna bring jobs. The knowledge economy is the future. Uh, you know, we need to, you know, increase this is gonna be such a boon for New York City uh, in bringing all of these um, new jobs to the area. Um, so let's kind of take a closer look at these three arguments and see sort of um, who ends up reaping the benefits and who ends up getting hurt in these three myths of science washing. So the first myth, science helps everyone. Um, I think that we don't have to go too far back in history to sort of see the ways that science has actually harmed a lot of our communities. Um, so in the 30s and 40s, science was very much involved in eugenics um, research, so they would use quote unquote scientific methods like craniometry to justify biological racism. And this was actually very important for furthering racist policies in the United States um, and inspired the Nazis in Germany. So the Nazis were like, oh, look at what these US scientists are doing. Uh, let's do that here. Um, and I think, you know, the speaker before us talked about how a lot of the research studies that have been done in marginalized communities like on black folks have historically been 
um, very harmful. So the Tuskegee syphilis study was a study the US Public Health Service did in rural Alabama where they basically went into these communities and said that they were going to, to participate in the experiment, they would get free health care. But instead, they left their syphilis go untreated so they could study the progression of the disease. Um, this you know, has led to continuing mistrust in a lot of black communities of science and medicine. And then, you know, most infamously, science has been very much a part of uh, our military industrial complex, um, creating these weapons of mass destruction like the atomic bomb or Agent Orange, which in addition to causing immense loss of life also leads to intergenerational health defects and environmental degradation. But, you know, of course you might say like, well, Alexis, a cure for Alzheimer's disease can't be that bad, <laughs> you know, they're not going, they're not building uh, nuclear weapons or anything. And that's true, but um, let's, kind of take a deeper look into the process of what creating a cure for Alzheimer's disease actually looks like and you know who stands to benefit from it. So actually most of the drugs, drug research that happens is funded by the public, by taxpayers. Um, so 84% of research is funded through the federal government which they give to institutions like Columbia or other researchers to do the innovative high risk, high reward research that um, most two thirds of our breakthrough drugs come from. Um, pharmaceutical companies also do invest a lot of money in R&D, but usually they are sort of just tweaking existing drugs to kind of create new patents. And most of that isn't really, um, yeah, the breakthrough drugs that are needed for you know, cr uh, addressing more of these challenging conditions. Uh, and once if you're at a university and you sort of are working on your research and something seems like it might have potential for being an effective drug, it goes through a process called tech transfer. Um, so in the, every university has some sort of tech transfer office. Columbia's is Columbia Technology Ventures. And as they are sort of boasting here, you know, the hundreds of inventions that come through Columbia, the university actually gets a part of the patenting and intellectual property licensing. And this form of commercialization is actually bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars into the university. Um, so the university has a you know, financial interest in things like biomedical research beyond you know, being a good player in the world and actually stands to make a bit of money from it. Um, and to do this, they have very cozy relationships with pharmaceutical companies. I just kind of quickly Googled Columbia and some of the pharmaceutical partnerships they have, like AstraZeneca or Sanofi Aventis, and I'm sure there are many, many more. Um, and Columbia is actually very good at <laughs> commercializing their intellectual property. They're about the second highest ranked in the country for the amount of intellectual property revenue that they're bringing in, and it's mostly from biotech and other types of biomedical research. And when these drugs are, you know, refined, brought to market. Um, you know, I think we know our current state of U.S. healthcare um, is not really accessible to most people. Um, so when we think about the residents of Manhattanville, 30% of which live below the poverty line, and the exorbitant costs of these drugs that, you remember, were originally funded by the public, um, the cost of the Alzheimer's medications on the market right now is about $170 to $480 per month which is gonna be out of reach for most of the folks who live in Manhattanville. And so if we think about who benefits, um, mostly Columbia and the intellectual property revenue and the pharmaceutical companies who reap the profits of these drugs, um, and you know, who's harmed? If we're gonna do a cost-benefit analysis of health outcomes, we should also think about the harms associated, health effects associated with gentrification. So there have been studies that show that black residents um, report worse health conditions in gentrifying neighborhoods than their white counterparts. Gentrification causes the disruption of social networks that a lot of folks rely on. There's the you know, fear and the health risks associated with displacement and homelessness. And so we see in terms of uh, science is actually, in a lot of cases, exacerbating these already existing inner inequalities, where a thing like the cure for Alzheimer's disease is helping those who already have a lot, where those who don't have a lot do not end up reaping any benefits at all or are actually harmed in the process. So myth number two, universities are forces of good. So we talked a little bit about how Columbia has these cozy relationships with some of these big corporations. But we kind of have to go further and start thinking about the university itself as being kind of like a corporation. 
Um, so this wasn't always the case. You know, during after World War II and the GI Bill, universities were much more public-facing institutions that were open to a broad swath of people. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, when the market started to go down, there were a, a huge disinvestment in higher education. Um, and the narrative around education started to change. So instead of thinking of education as being a societal good that you know, makes a more educated, better functioning public, we started thinking of education as being an individual investment in your human capital to make you more competitive in the global marketplace. And this has really informed the way that we talk about things like student debt. And um, the university started taking on a lot of corporate practices uh, like union busting or a lot of the t you know, people who are teaching the classes now at the university aren't tenure track professors but low wage adjunct professors. Um, and so in this new paradigm, the university is like a business. Uh, the president is more like a CEO who spends most of his time doing fundraising. And the student is more like a customer that's purchasing a service. Um, and so these universities are basically not just about trying to provide a high quality education, but they're really trying to now expand to create these luxury amenities to compete for this like top 1% of students. Um, and in this new university arms race that really is promoting more and more building, more and more expansion, um, we see that the motivations for this expansion are often not about the university's mission or helping the public, but are really grounded in increasing the amount of research funding. Um, so if Harvard builds a new research lab, Columbia needs to build a new research lab so that they are more competitive when they're applying for the same grant money. Um, they want to be number one in the ranks, the number one medical school, the number one business school. They want to be prestigious and you know, be your, the worth of your degree is correlated to the prestige of the university. And you know, the rankings and the prestige are also often tied to the need to collect more donor money. Um, so you can go to the alum like, look how great we've made this university. Um, you know, don't you want to have your name associated with it on this building? <laughs> Um, so even though we think of universities as being like nonprofits, they actually are mostly driven by a financial incentive. And we can go even further and uh, sort of see that the universities have the financial clout of a like multinational corporation. Um, so this is a list of the largest university endowments in the U.S. Um, an endowment is sort of like this big pot of money that's mostly invested in things like hedge funds and the university only skims off a bit of the interest to pay for its university operations and just kind of lets it sit and accrue money. So Harvard, which in 2014 had the largest endowment, $36 billion, um, I think now it's like $38 billion, um, is high, has a higher amount of money in its endowment than the GDP of over half the countries in the world. Um, Columbia, with its more modest $9 billion, <laughs> um, you know, still has like access to a lot of wealth and resources. And so when we think about the amount of power that Columbia has compared to the residents of Manhattanville, which you remember 30% live below the poverty line, we see that there's really this huge power disparity. Um, and that Columbia probably doesn't need to develop in a place like Manhattanville. Like they have the resources if they would like to, to develop in a place maybe like Midtown Manhattan or some other neighborhood where the impacts of their development will be less harmful to those neighbors. And you know, we can even go and say like, are these really universities or nonprofits or are they kind of more like hedge funds that do sometimes do research and teach people? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it kind of makes sense that these universities are governing with these corporate uh, tactics because most of the people doing the decision making and governing the school are business elites. So I kind of went through all of the profiles of the trustees of Columbia and about 60% of them work in some financial industry uh, like Goldman Sachs, venture capital, real estate, one of the big banks. Um, and so they're bringing those tactics and practices into the way that the university operates. And finally, myth number three, um, you know, it's going to create so many jobs and be, you know, a leader in the knowledge economy for New York City. 
which I say, yeah, it'll bring in jobs, but jobs for who? Um, so, you know, as Steph mentioned earlier, Morningside Heights is a like very wealthy white collar area here. And so the dark blue is folks who have advanced degrees. And a lot of that is because of the presence of Columbia here. And then we look right north to Manhattanville, most of those people have less than a high school diploma. And when we think about jobs at places like universities and research labs, most of those require a very high degree of education, uh, like minimally a bachelor's degree, but more likely a master's or a PhD level degree. So most of the jobs that um, are gonna be made in that area are not gonna be really in reach for the residents of Manhattanville. Um, and you know this also affects what these communities were going to end up looking like. So the scientific workforce is, you know, <laughs> not a diverse one. <laughs> um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. So the majority of scientists are white men, white women, some Asian men and women, and then maybe the last eight to ten percent are black men or women, or black or brown men and women. Um, and this is very different from the racial demographics of uh, Manhattanville, which is majority Hispanic and black. Um, and so when you create something like a new research campus, you are attracting folks to move into that area that look very different from the community that's already there. And we've seen this happen in places like the Bay Area and their Silicon Valley tech boom. Um, so here in 1980, you see that most of the counties in the Bay Area are majority people of color. And then in 2010 already, four out of five of these counties are majority white. And this trend is probably only going to continue into the future as more and more white transplants move into the city um, to work at these startups and these tech industry jobs. Um, and so I think what this says is that um, when we talk about gentrification, we're often thinking about the supply side, like how we need to build more units and um, sort of accommodate these transplants as they come in. We can like build our way out. But I think we can also think of it from the demand side. Why are we creating a demand to bring in this workforce into a place um, that looks so different from the community that's already there? Um, are, who are we trying to create jobs for? Are we trying to create jobs for the residents that have been living there for decades? Or are we trying to create jobs for the sort of global, wealthier, privileged uh, workforce um, that maybe isn't as dependent on their community ties as you know, people like the residents in Manhattanville? So um, Manhattanville and Morningside Heights are examples of displacement that has already occurred. We're going to cross the Atlantic and um, look at an example of a place that's just really starting to actively grapple with uh, gentrification and displacement. Um, so I got to spend uh, this past fall in Berlin uh, for a fellowship called the Berlin Science Communication Award. It was funded by the German government um, and hosted at Humboldt University. And uh, the fellowship invited foreign journalists to Berlin to learn about all of the exciting science and innovation happening there. This is part of a larger push from the German and Berlin governments to really brand Berlin as a, a city of science, research, and tech. Um, we met with many government representatives and science administrators about how uh, the German government is really prioritizing investment in research um, and how Berlin is poised to become the European Silicon Valley uh, now that Brexit is happening and London and Paris are becoming so expensive. Um, you know, and investment in research, you know, it sounds like a good thing, right? Um, so this, this push, uh, it's helpful to situate, situate it in a bit of history. So uh, before World War II, Berlin was sort of a hub of industry. Um, but then when the war ended and Soviet occupation happened, a lot of companies moved out of Berlin into West Germany. Uh, and even after Germany reunified and the Cold War was over, um, those companies just stayed put in West Germany. Uh, they didn't move back to Berlin. So for decades, uh, Berlin has had sort of large tracts of abandoned warehouses, uh, low rents, a culture of squatting. This is a really attracted sort of a bohemian demographic that earns little and pays little in taxes. Um, for decades, uh, the rest of Germany has actually subsidized Berlin. It's the only uh, European capital that actually brings down its country's GDP. 
Um, but, uh, you know, in the past decade, Berlin has started to catch glimpses of prosperity. Uh, you know, the artistic, sort of risk-taking, creative culture started to attract um, tech startups. And the city of Berlin, you know, recognized this. It, tax revenue went up. Uh, you know, income was finally being generated in Berlin. And so uh, in the past decade and past few years, the governments have really been, uh, you know, embracing this new identity of Berlin being a cradle of knowledge and science. So just to give you an example of that, I'm going to play a short uh, excerpt from a uh, promo video for the city. People speak about Berlin as they do today about Boston, Harvard, or New York. Then our dream comes true. Quality of life and highest scientific excellence is what we want to achieve. Berlin is the place where we create and where we embrace and anticipate future. And I must say, I do like it. <laughs> we are doing research with humanoid robotics and this means that we, on the one side, address technical issues, on the other side, also look into human-machine interaction. In Berlin, science and politics and media and art comes together, and these are, of course, the optimal prerequisites for doing future projects like, for example, robotics or the city of the future. Okay, so that's just to give you a little taste. So uh, <laughs> Berlin has created a new name for itself, Brain City. Um, you know, it's really portraying itself as a science and research metropolis where people like Albert Einstein and Max Planck have their roots. Um, a big part of this campaign is attracting foreign money, expertise, and ideas to Berlin. So, uh, you know, it's attracting over 48,000 people a year to the city. Uh, over five years, that's about like 200,000 foreigners to 45,000 Germans. Um, so what that's creating, it's, it's bringing sort of a really elite international demographic to Berlin. Uh, that's coinciding with other things. So, you know, there's also a large influx of refugees coming into Berlin. Um, and, you know, there are quite different expectations for these groups. So, refugees, it's really hammered into them that they have to demonstrate Germanness. You know, they have to become fluent in German, they have to really integrate. Um, whereas, a lot of folks working in science and tech can live in Berlin for years and not learn German, send their kids to international schools, uh, frequent expat businesses. They don't necessarily develop a deeper uh, tie or engagement with the city. Uh, and also, you know, obviously, rents are going up. Uh, at the same time, wages are not increasing as quickly as rents. In fact, the poverty rate in Berlin has actually increased. It's now at 22%, and more than half of the city's population qualifies for public housing. Um, so the effect of this is that low earners are really being pushed out of neighborhoods where they've often lived for decades. They've become a fabric of the neighborhood. Uh, they're being pushed to the outskirts of the city. There, sociologists warn of damaging effects of segregation. Um, kids that grow up in the outskirts sometimes never see uh, central or downtown Berlin. That means, you know, their chances of social mobility are much reduced. Um, it also is feeding into resentment or sometimes outright hostility between folks who feel like they're being left behind and these affluent newcomers. And, uh, oh, so, sorry. So, <laughs> um, it's, you know, this is a part of a larger concern of uh, knowledge economies. So, Berlin is not the only city that is branding itself as sort of this, like, brain or knowledge city. It's happening actually all around the world. So, in Providence, which I talked about earlier, they have rebranded their jewelry district, which was named after the jewelry manufacturing companies that used to be there, as part of a larger knowledge district. Uh, there are also knowledge or innovation districts in um, Baltimore, Detroit, San Diego, in the U.S., and in Stockholm, Barcelona, and Seoul abroad. Uh, and the idea that's driving this is really that um, intangible capital, so like knowledge and innovation are the basis of our future economies. It's really a shift away from um, things like agriculture, manufacturing, and mass production. So you, it's thought that like research and development, data management, communication, you know, creative problem solving, these are the sorts of things that are going to drive 
job creation and economic growth. Um, but you know, as you as from our examples, um, there are also larger problems with knowledge economies. So even if a university or research institution is not directly displacing uh, people it, like Columbia. Um, oftentimes, they are, you know, attracting faculty, providing housing, providing housing subsidies, and really creating clusters of those creative class, you know, faculty who are coming into the neighborhoods around the university. And this creates demand for better schools, better amenities, and better services in certain parts of cities, kickstarting a cycle of gentrification. Um, it's worth noting that this cycle is also shaped by public investment. So, uh, you know, the government is obviously funding universities. Um, it's often, you know, governments are often giving many grants to foreign visiting scholars. The German government gives many grants to visiting scholars. Uh, they also give tax breaks and form collaborations with tech companies. So, one example in Berlin is the Einstein Center for Digital Future. Um, it is a public-private collaboration. Here are some of its um, donors and partners. All of this is not necessarily the way that people thought that knowledge economies would pan out. So in the 50s, um, you know, people sort of uh, hypothesized that as countries became more technologically advanced, inequality would actually go down. The idea there is that it's more of a merit-based system where, you know, success is built off things like skill and creativity rather than physical assets or nepotism. Um, but, you know, we're seeing that that's not the case. In the wealthiest countries in the world, the rich are getting richer. They're staying richer across generations. Um, it seems that tech and knowledge economies actually favor a small group of individuals the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Elon Musks, it magnifies their talent and their luck, um, and it creates, you know, a disappearing middle class, and poverty deepens, and wealth, you know, increases, leading to sort of extremes on both sides. Um, so what do we do about all of this? Um, <laughs> we don't want to leave you <laughs> depressed, um, so um, what's think about our sort of first, as we intro, you know, why should we maybe protest when the lab moves in next door? Um, so there are two main ways that I like to think about this. One is if the university is in a community, how can they be a better neighbor? Um, so there are a lot of really cool models for community science, because uh, we talked about all the ways that science is like magnifying these already existing inequalities. Um, so one model that I think is really interesting is the science shop, where universities or can have like open office hours and people from the community can come and tell them what their issues are and they can sort of see if they can lend their leverage their scientific and technical knowledge to help those communities. Uh, so for example, a, someone might come in and be like, hey, can you test the soil in my yard because I live down the street from an oil rig? Um, and maybe actually addressing some of their problems. And you can kind of imagine that maybe if something like that was in place in Michigan, that the issues of the Flint water crisis might have become to our attention much earlier. Um, this, another model for community science is community-based participatory research. So this is from the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, which was basically a research project in Louisiana where residents were having a lot of health problems, asthma, other respiratory problems, and they were convinced that it was because of the toxins that were being released by a factory nearby. So what they did is, you know, they partnered with scientists who developed this sort of like easy to use, low cost, um, air quality collection system, testing system, uh, that they trained the you know, community members to use. So um, every time it seemed like there was some sort of bigger release of toxins into the air, the community members would go out and take samples. And th they got to use this data and lobby the EPA and say, hey, this really is a health concern. And that actually moved the EPA to more heavily regulate those industries. Uh, you know, there are also examples of universities creating institutions and research initiatives that really uh, cater to problem solving for their local communities. So one example at Humboldt University is uh, there's an institute that's dedicated to research on migration and refugees. Um, there's also an urban planning lab at uh, the Technical University of Berlin, and they do a lot of participatory research. Um, 
there's actually a law in Berlin, a new law where uh, for housing projects, there has to be new housing projects, there has to be some sort of participatory element. So a lot of what this lab does is facilitate conversations between local residents, business owners, and policymakers when there is you know, a proposal for a new high rise or some other type of development. Um, UC Berkeley, UCLA, and Portland State University, they also have a research initiative that's dedicated to anti-gentrification called the Urban Displacement Project. There are other things that universities can do. Uh, you know, they can reserve admission spots and scholarships specifically for low-income households in their region. Uh, another thing that I've thought about uh, a lot recently is participatory budgeting. So this is something that um, city and municipal governments do to allocate their like infrastructure budget. And I think how this could look in a university setting is, say, Columbia um, allocates a portion of its funding, um, and and uh, you know asks for proposals from Harlem residents. What are some research projects that would really address your needs? Y the university could vet uh, these needs to make sure that it fits with its capabilities and then put it to a vote um, and have actually local residents voting on these research projects. And that could really change the profile of the research that's being done. You could you might see more research on you know, environmental justice. You might see more research on occupational health or medical research that focuses on marginalized groups or uh, people of color. Um, and on an individual level, I, I don't know if there are scientists in this room, but people, I encourage people to think about your own research, where you are getting your research questions from, um, challenging the way that your department works or your institution works. Uh, I think that there's a sense that science is really hierarchical. You know, if I don't have tenure, I actually don't have any power to do anything. But that's not the case. Actually, grad students, a lot of your grants go to university overhead. Collectively, that's a lot of power to organize and demand change. Oh, but these are all Band-Aid solutions. <laughs> so Alexa's going to talk about deeper ones. Yeah, so, you know, those sort of solutions are kind of the like, oh, if I'm already gentrifying this neighborhood, I'll shop at the local store across the street. Um, <laughs> but maybe we should question, should these universities be neighbors to these communities at all, and how do we stop this trend from happening in the future? Um, so just in the same way that, you know, scientists can, you know, engage community members in their science, we can also think of scientists engaging in their communities as citizens. Um, so this picture is one from last year when Free Radicals, we went to the March for Science. And the March for Science was a really interesting moment because for the first time in recent memory, you saw scientists really mobilizing out on the streets and engaging with issues. Um, but what's a little disheartening for me is that you know the only time that they really do step up and engage in that way is when their professional livelihoods and their research budgets are at risk and on the line. Um, and I think, you know, we talked about all these different ways that science and technology are heavily implicated in things like gentrification or, you know, imperialism and military development and, you know, environmental issues. Um, and so I think it's really important as scientists who are already in a very privileged class of people, have more access, are generally more educated, wealthier, also are in these institutions that have tremendous access, um, that they can think of ways to leverage these positions of power to help marginalized communities. Um, so right now in LA, where I'm based out of, um, Free Radicals is having a campaign to stop the development of a research park that USC and LA County wants to build in East LA, which is a majority low income Mexican American community that's been fighting gentrification for the past decade. Um, and we're partnering with faculty at USC who are sort of using their positions to really challenge the university's agenda. They're sort of like sharing information with the community organizers about what the university's trying to do and really acting as an accomplice to these social movements. And we know uh, from real world examples that organizing and resistance works. So, you know, as I talked about, uh, Berlin is really starting to seriously wrestle with uh, gentrification. Um, there's been actually a lot of really successful grassroots resistance in Berlin. And that has actually forced the government to impose, uh, you know, a lot of protections and anti gentrification measures. There are rent control laws, there's development free zones, there's a 
pretty large partial ban on Airbnb. Um, in some cases, the city and municipal governments have stepped in to actually uh, forbid speculators from buying buildings, and they've actually maintained it as affordable housing. Um, and perhaps one of the most visible examples of Berliners uh, successfully fighting developers is uh, this park called Tempelhofer Feld. Uh, it's an abandoned airfield that airplanes used to take off uh, from here, um, but today it is a park. And some years ago, you know, the Berlin, you know, politicians and investors were like, oh, this is a gaping opportunity for development. Um, but there was actually a lot of protest against it, and so the city put it to a vote. And, you know, the city of Berlin voted to actually forbid any development on this park. Uh, so today, if you go there, it's 300 hectares of sort of raw, open, green space. It's being left alone. It's being left to actually sort of like unravel back into nature. And it's an incredible space to be in, um, you know, this incredible expanse. And it's hard to imagine that something like this could happen in the US. Um, we're going to leave you with one last story ending where we started. So back in the 60s, uh, in Morningside Heights, Columbia decides that it needs a gym for its students, and it wants to build this gym in Morningside Park. Uh, similar to the SROs, Columbia sees Morningside Park as really a breeding grounds for blight. Uh, they see a lot of people of color there, drinking and gambling and doing who knows what, and so they want to create a gym there to basically police and control that environment. Um, and theoretically, the park is also accessible to the public, but only certain parts of the gym and only through a separate entrance in the back. Uh, and so at this point, um, Morningside Heights and Harlem residents are pretty fed up. They are angry about this segregated gym, which they nicknamed Jim Crow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they, <laughs> they actually organize a, a bunch of protests and occupation of university buildings and successfully force the university to scrap their plans to build the gym. Uh, adjacent to this, there was actually a really strong squatters movement that emerged on the Upper West Side. Uh, it birthed a um, Puerto Rican activist group called El Comite, and the legacy of this group is still very much alive today in Puerto Rican uh, communities in New York. And today, Morningside Park is not a gym for Columbia. It is a park where uh, Harlem families that have lived there for uh, generations can still bring their kids to play. It's also still a place where the tensions of gentrification are continuing to play out today. Uh, you know, you have new affluent white Harlem residents who are occupying the space more and more. But hopefully, uh, as we have shown you in this talk today, the fate of Morningside Park and the fate of the world at large can be shaped by people coming together, asking the right questions, and demanding change. So if you are as mad about these things as we are, <laughs> um, so we have little handouts on some of the tables. Um, these, you know, gentrification is happening all over the city. Um, so these are lists of some groups that are working on gentrification in all five of the boroughs. Um, if you're interested in more about how science is implicated in these larger social issues, uh, you can check out our group. It's called Free Radicals. You can check out our website, freerads.org. Um, but there's also Science for the People in New York City and the DSA chapter that focuses on tech and uh, algorithms. Yes, and um, we wanted to also thank uh, Nina Migulaszczyk. Uh, she coordinates the Berlin uh, Science Communication Award. If you're interested in learning more about that fellowship, please feel free to ask her about it. Uh, we also wanted to thank Yiran Liu for helping us with research. And feel free to come talk to us as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>